The Worm Ouroboros by E. R. Edison Narrated by Jack Chikijian The Induction There was a man named Lessingham, dwelt in an old low house in Wasdale, set in a grey old garden where yew trees flourished that had seen Vikings in Copeland in their seedling time. Lily and rose and larkspur bloomed in the borders, and begonias with blossoms big as saucers, red and white and pink and lemon colour, in the beds before the porch. Climbing roses, honeysuckle, clematis, and the scarlet flame flower scrambled up the walls. Thick woods were on every side without the garden, with a gap northeastward opening on the desolate lake and the great fells beyond it. Gable rearing his crag bound head against the sky from behind the straight clean outline of the screes. Cool long shadows stole across the tennis lawn. The air was golden. Doves murmured in the trees. Two chaffinches played on the near post of the net. A little water wagtail scurried along the path. A French window stood open to the garden, showing darkly a dining room panelled with old oak, its Jacobean table bright with flowers and silver and cut glass, and wedgewood dishes heaped with fruit, green gauges, peaches and green muscat grapes. Lessingham lay back in a hammock chair, watching through the blue smoke of an after-dinner cigar the warm light on the gloire de Dijon roses that clustered about the bedroom window overhead. He had her hand in his. This was their house. Should we finish that chapter of Nial? she said. She took the heavy volume with its faded green cover and read. He went out on the night of the Lord's Day, when nine weeks were still to winter. He heard a great crash, so that he thought both heaven and earth shook. Then he looked into the west art, and he thought he saw hereabouts a ring of fiery hue, and within the ring a man on a grey horse. He passed quickly by him and rode hard. He had a flaming firebrand in his hand, and he rode so close to him that he could see him plainly. He was black as pitch and he sung this song with a mighty voice. Here I ride, swift steed, his flank flecked with rhyme, rain from his mane drips, horse mighty for harm, flames flare at each end, gall glows in the midst, so fares it with Flossie's redes, as this flaming brand flies, and so fares it with Flossie's redes, as this flaming brand flies. Then he thought he hurled the firebrand east towards the fells before him, and such a blaze of fire leapt up to meet it that he could not see the fells for the blaze. It seemed as though that man rode east among the flames and vanished there. After that he went to his bed, and was senseless for a long time, but at last he came to himself. He bore in mind all that had happened, and told his father, but he bade him tell it to Hjalti Skeggi's son. So he went and told Hjalti, but he said he had seen the wolf's ride, and that comes ever before great tidings. They were silent a while. Then Lessingham said suddenly, Do you mind if we sleep in the East Wing tonight? What, in the lotus room? Yes. I'm too much of a lazy bones tonight, dear, she answered. Do you mind if I go alone, then? I shall be back to breakfast. I like my lady with me. Still, we can go again when next moon wanes. My pet is not frightened, is she? No, she said, laughing, but her eyes were a little big. Her fingers played with his watch chain. I'd rather, she said presently, 
you went later on and took me. All this is so odd still, the house and that, and I love it so. And after all, it is a long way and several years too sometimes in the lotus room, even though it is all over next morning. I'd rather we went together. If anything happened then, well, we'd both be done in, and it wouldn't matter so much, would it? Both be what? said Lessingham. I'm afraid your language is not all that might be wished. Well, you taught me, she said, and they laughed. They sat there till the shadows crept over the lawn and up the trees and the high rocks of the mountain shoulder beyond burned red in the evening rays. He said, if you like to stroll a bit of way up the fell side, Mercury is visible tonight. We might get a glimpse of him just after sunset. A little later, standing on the open hillside below the hawking bats, they watched for the dim planet that showed at last low down in the west between the sunset and the dark. He said, it is as if Mercury had a finger on me tonight, Mary. It's no good my trying to sleep tonight, except in the lotus room. Her arm tightened in his. Mercury, she said, it is another world. It is too far. But he laughed and said, nothing is too far. They turned back as the shadows deepened. As they stood in the dark of the arched gate leading from the open fell into the garden, the soft, clear notes of a spinet sounded from the house. She put up a finger. Hark, she said, your daughter playing Le Barricard. They stood listening. She loves playing, he whispered. I'm glad we taught her to play. Presently he whispered again. Le Barricard Mysterials. What inspired Couperon with that enchanted name? And only you and I know what it really means. Le Barricard Mysterials. That night Lessingham lay alone in the lotus room. Its casements opened eastward on the sleeping woods and the sleeping bare slopes of Il Gilhead. He slept soft and deep for that was the house of post-meridian and the house of peace. In the deep and dead time of the night, when the waning moon peered over the mountain's shoulder, he woke suddenly. The silver beams shone through the open window on a form perched at the foot of the bed. A little bird, black, round-headed, short-beaked, with long, sharp wings and eyes like two stars shining. It spoke and said, Time is. So Lessingham got up and muffled himself in a great cloak that lay on a chair beside the bed. He said, I am ready, my little martlet. For that was the house of heart's desire. Surely the martlet's eyes filled all the room with starlight. It was an old room with lotuses carved on the panels and on the bed and chairs and roof beams. And in the glamour the carved flowers swayed like water lilies in a lazy stream. He went to the window and the little martlet sat on his shoulder. A chariot, coloured like the halo about the moon, waited by the window poised in air, harnessed to a strange steed, a horse it seemed, but winged like an eagle, and its forelegs feathered and armed with the eagle's claws instead of hooves. He entered the chariot, and that little martlet sat on his knee. With a whir of wings the wild courser sprang skyward, the night about them was like the tumult of bubbles about a diver's ears diving in a deep pool under a smooth, steep rock in a mountain cataract. Time was swallowed up in speed. 
the world reeled, and it was but as the space between two deep breaths, till that strange courser spread wide his rainbow wings, and slanted down the night over a great island that slumbered on a slumbering sea, with lesser isles about it, a country of rock mountains and hill pastures, and many waters, all a glimmer in the moonshine. They landed within a gate crowned with golden lions. Lessingham came down from the chariot, and the little black martlet circled about his head, showing him a yew avenue leading from the gates. As in a dream, he followed her. 1. The Castle of Lord Juss the eastern stars were paling to the dawn as Lessingham followed his conductor along the grass walk between the shadowy ranks of Irish ewes that stood like soldiers mysterious and expectant in the darkness. The grass was bathed in night dew, and great white lilies sleeping in the shadows of the ewes loaded the air of that garden with fragrance. Lessingham felt no touch of the ground beneath his feet and when he stretched out his hand to touch a tree, his hand passed through branch and leaves, as though they were unsubstantial as a moonbeam. The little martlet, alighting on his shoulder, laughed in his ear. Child of earth, she said, do you think we are here in dreamland? He answered nothing, and she said, this is no dream. You, first of the children of men, are come to Mercury, where you and I will journey up and down for a season, to show you the lands and oceans, the forests, plains, and ancient mountains, cities and palaces of this world, Mercury, and the doings of them that dwell therein. But here you cannot handle anything, neither make the folk ware of you. Not though you shout your throat hoarse. For you and I walk here impalpable and invisible, as it were two dreams walking. They were now on the marble steps, which led from the yew walk to the terrace opposite the great gate of the castle. No need to unbar gates to you and me, said the martlet, as they passed beneath the darkness of that ancient portal carved with strange devices, and clean through the massy timbers of the bolted gate, thickly riveted with silver, into the inner court. Go we into the lofty presence chamber, and there tarry a while. Morning is kindling the upper air, and folk will soon be stirring in the castle, for they lie not long abed when day begins in demon land. For be it known to you, O earth-born, that this land is demon land, and this castle the castle of Lord Juss, and this day now dawning his birthday, when the demons hold high festival in Juss's castle, to do honour unto him and to his brethren, Spitfire and Goldry Blues Co. And these and their fathers before them bear rule from time immemorial in demon land and have the lordship over all the demons. She spoke, and the first low beams of the sun smote javelin-like through the eastern windows, and the freshness of morning breathed and shimmered in that lofty chamber, chasing the blue and dusky shades of departed night to the corners and recesses, and to the rafters of the vaulted roof. Surely, no potentate of earth, not Croesus, not the great king, not Minos in his royal palace in Crete, not all the pharaohs, not Queen Semiramis, nor all the kings of Babylon and Nineveh had ever a throne room to compare in glory with that high presence chamber of the lords of demon land. Its walls and pillars were of snow white marble every vein whereof was set with small gems, rubies, corals, garnets, and pink topaz. Seven pillars on either side bore up the shadowy vault of the roof, 
the roof tree and the beams were of gold, curiously carved, the roof itself of mother of pearl. A side aisle ran behind each row of pillars, and seven paintings on the western side faced seven spacious windows on the east. At the end of the hall, upon a dais, stood three high seats, the arms of each composed of two hippogriffs, wrought in gold, with wings spread, and the legs of the seats the legs of the hippogriffs. But the body of each high seat was a single jewel of monstrous size, the left-hand seat a black opal, a sparkle with steel-blue fire, the next a fire opal, as it were a burning coal, the third seat an alexandrite, purple like wine by night, but deep sea-green by day. Ten more pillars stood in semicircle behind the high seats, bearing up above them and the dais a canopy of gold. The benches that ran from end to end of the lofty chamber were of cedar, inlaid with coral and ivory, and so were the tables that stood before the benches. The floor of the chamber was tessellated, of marble and green tourmaline, and on every square of tourmaline was carven the image of a fish, as the dolphin, the conger, the catfish, the salmon, the tunny, the squid, and other wonders of the deep. Hangings of tapestry were behind the high seats, worked with flowers, snake's head, snapdragon, dragon mouth, and their kind, and on the dado below the windows were sculptures of birds and beasts and creeping things. But a great wonder of this chamber, and a marvel to behold, was how the capital of every one of the four-and-twenty pillars was hewn from a single precious stone, carved by the hand of some sculptor of long ago, into the living form of a monster. Here was a harpy with screaming mouth, so wondrously cut in ochre-tinted jade, it was a marvel to hear no scream from her. Here in wine-yellow topaz a flying fire-drake, there a cockatrice made of a single ruby, there a star-sapphire the colour of moonlight, cut for a cyclops, so that the rays of the star trembled from his single eye. Salamanders, mermaids, chimeras, wild men of the woods, leviathans all hewn from faultless gems, thrice the bulk of a big man's body, velvet dark sapphires, crystallite, beryl, amethyst, and a yellow zircon that is like transparent gold. To give light to the presence chamber were seven escarbuncles, great as pumpkins, hung in order down the length of it, and nine fair moonstones, standing in order on silver pedestals between the pillars on the dais. These jewels, drinking in the sunshine by day, gave it forth during the hours of darkness in a radiance of pink light, and a soft effulgence as of moonbeams. And yet another marvel, the nether side of the canopy over the high seats was encrusted with lapis lazuli, and in that feigned dome of heaven burned the twelve signs of the zodiac, every star a diamond that shone within its own light. Folk now began to be astir in the castle, and there came a score of serving men into the presence chamber with brooms and brushes, cloths and leathers, to sweep and garnish it, and burnish the gold and jewels of the chamber. Lissome they were, and sprightly of gait, of fresh complexion and fair-haired. Horns grew on their heads. When their tasks were accomplished, they departed, and the presence began to fill with guests. A joy it was to see such a shifting maze of velvets, furs, curious needleworks, and cloth of tissue, tiffanies, laces, ruffs, goodly chains, and carcanets of gold. Such glitter of jewels and weapons, 
such nodding of the plumes the demons wore in their hair, half veiling the horns that grew upon their heads. Some were sitting on the benches or leaning on the polished tables, some walking forth and back upon the shining floor. Here and there were women among them, women so fair one had said it is surely white-armed Helen this one, this Arcadian Atalanta, this Phryne that stood to Praxiteles for Aphrodite's picture, this Thais for whom great Alexander to pleasure her fantasy did burn Persepolis like a candle, this she that was wrapped by the dark god from the flowering fields of Enna, to be queen for ever among the dead that be departed. Now came a stir near the stately doorway, and Lessingham beheld a demon of burly frame and noble port, richly attired. His face was ruddy and somewhat freckled, his forehead wide, his eyes calm and blue like the sea. His beard, thick and tawny, was parted and brushed back and upwards on either side. Tell me, my little martlet, said Lessingham, is this Lord Juss? This is not Lord Juss, answered the martlet, nor any so worshipful as he. The Lord you see is Vola, who dwells under Cartadza by the salt sea. A great sea captain is he, and one that did service to the cause of demon land, and of the whole world besides, in the late wars against the ghouls. But cast your eyes again towards the door, where one stands amid a knot of friends, tall and somewhat stooping, in a corslet of silver, and a cloak of old brocaded silk coloured eek tarnished gold. Something like Tuvola in feature, but swarthy, and with bristling black moustaches. I see him, said Lessingham. Then this is Lord Juss? Not so, said Martlet. It's but Viz, brother Tuvola. He is wealthiest in goods of all the demons, save the three brethren only, and Lord Brandoch Daha. And who is this? asked Lessingham, pointing to one of light and brisk step and humorous eye, who in that moment met Vola and engaged him in converse apart. Handsome of face he was, albeit somewhat long-nosed and sharp-nosed, keen and hard and filled with life and the joy of it. Here you behold, answered she, Lord Zig the far-famed tamer of horses. Well-loved is he among the demons, for he is merry of mood, and a mighty man of his hands withal when he leads his horsemen against the enemy. Vola threw up his beard and laughed a great laugh at some jest that Zig whispered in his ear, and Lessingham leaned forward into the hall, if haply he might catch what was said. The hum of talk drowned the words, but leaning forward Lessingham saw where the arras curtains behind the dais parted for a moment, and one of princely bearing advanced past the high seats, down the body of the hall. His gait was delicate, as of some lithe beast of prey, newly wakened out of slumber, and he greeted with lazy grace the many friends who hailed his entrance. Very tall was that lord, and slender of build, like a girl. His tunic was of silk coloured like the wild rose, and embroidered in gold with representations of flowers and thunderbolts. Jewels glittered on his left hand, and on the golden bracelets on his arms, and on the fillet twined among the golden curls of his hair, set with plumes of the king bird of paradise. His horns were dyed with saffron and inlaid with filigree work of gold. His buskins were laced with gold, and from his belt hung a sword, narrow of blade and keen, 
the hilt rough with beryls and black diamonds. Strangely light and delicate was his frame, and seeming, yet with a sense of slumbering power beneath, as the delicate peak of a snow mountain, seen afar in the low red rays of morning. His face was beautiful to look upon, and softly coloured like a girl's face, and his expression one of gentle melancholy, mixed with some disdain, but fiery glints awoke at intervals in his eyes, and the lines of swift determination hovered round the mouth below his curled moustache. At last, murmured Lessingham, at last, Lord Juss. Little are you to blame, said the martlet, for this misprision, for scarce could a lordlier sight have joyed your eyes. Yet is this not Juss, but Lord Brandoch Daha, to whom all demon land west of Shalgreth and Stropardon owes allegiance. The rich vineyards of Crathering, the broad pasture lands of Files, and all the western islands and their crag-bound fastnesses. Think not, because he affects silks and jewels like a queen, and carries himself light and dainty as a silver birch tree on the mountain, that his hand is light or his courage doubtful in war. For years was he held for the third best man-at-arms in all Mercury, along with these, Goldry Blues Co. and Go Rice the Tenth of Witchland. And Go Rice he slew nine summers back in single combat, when the witches harried in Goblin Land, and Brandoch Daha led five hundred and fourscore demons to succor Gaslark, the king of that country. And now none can surpass Lord Brandoch Daha in feat of arms, save perhaps Goldry alone. Yet lo, she said, as a sweet and wild music stole on the ear, and the guests turned towards the dais, and the hangings parted. At last the triple lordship of demon land. Strike softly, music. Smile, fates, on this festal day. Joy and safe days shine for this world and demon land. Turn your gaze first on him who walks in majesty in the midst, his tunic of olive-green velvet ornamented with devices of hidden meaning in thread of gold and beads of chrysolite. Mark how the buskins clasping his stalwart calves glitter with gold and amber. Mark the dusky cloak streamed with gold and lined with blood-red silk, a charmed cloak made by the sylphs in forgotten days, bringing good hap to the wearer, so he be true of heart and no dastard. Mark him that wears it, his sweet dark countenance, the violet fire in his eyes, the sombre warmth of his smile, like autumn woods in late sunshine. This is Lord Juss, Lord of this age-remembering castle, than whom none has more worship in wide demon land. Somewhat he knows of art magical, yet uses not that art, for it saps the life and strength, nor is it held worthy that a demon should put trust in that art, but rather in his own might and main. Now turn your eyes to him that leans on Juss's left arm, Shorter, but mayhap sturdier than he, apparelled in black silk that shimmers with gold as he moves, and crowned with black eagle's feathers among his horns and yellow hair. His face is wild and keen like a sea eagle's, and from his bristling brows the eyes dart glances sharp as a glancing spear. A faint flame, pallid like the fire of a will-o'-the-wisp, breathes ever and anon from his distended nostrils. This is Lord Spitfire, impetuous in war. Last, behold on Juss's right hand, 
that lord that bulks, mighty as Hercules, yet steps lightly as a heifer. The thews and sinews of his great limbs ripple as he moves beneath a skin whiter than ivory. His cloak of cloth of gold is heavy with jewels. His tunic of black sanderline has great hearts worked thereon in rubies and red silk thread. Slung from his shoulders clanks a two-handed sword, the pommel a huge star ruby carven in the image of a heart, for the heart is his sign and symbol. This is that sword forged by the elves, wherewith he slew the sea monster, as you may see in the painting on the wall. Noble is he of countenance, most like to his brother Juss, but darker brown of hair, and ruddier of hue, and bigger of cheekbone. Look well on him, for never shall your eyes behold a greater champion than the Lord Goldry Bluesco, captain of the hosts of Demonland. Now, when the greetings were done, and the strains of the lutes and recorders sighed and lost themselves in the shadowy vault of the roof, the cup-bearers did fill great gems made in form of cups with ancient wine, and the demons caroused to Lord Juss. Deep draughts in honour of this day of his nativity, and now they were ready to set forth by twos and threes into the parks and pleasances some to take their pleasure about the fair gardens and fish-ponds, some to hunt wild game among the wooded hills, some to disport themselves at quoits or tennis or riding at the ring or martial exercises, so that they might spend the live-long day as befits high holiday, in pleasure and action without care, and thereafter revel in the lofty presence chamber till night grew old with eating and drinking and all delight. But as they were upon going forth, a trumpet was sounded without, three strident blasts. What killjoy have we here? said Spitfire. The trumpet sounds only for travellers from the outlands. I feel it in my bones, some rascal is come to galing, one that brings ill hap in his pocket, and a shadow athwart the sun on this our day of festival. Speak no word of ill omen, answered Juss. Whosoever it be, we will straight dispatch his business, and so fall to pleasure indeed. Some... Run to the gate and bring him in. The serving man hastened and returned, saying, Lord, it is an ambassador from Witchland and his train. Their ship made land at Lookinghaven Ness at nightfall. They slept on board, and your soldiers gave them escort to Galing at break of day. He craves present audience. From Witchland, huh? said Juss. Such smokes use ever to go before the fire. Shalls bid the fellow, said Spitfire, wait on our pleasure. It is pity such should poison our gladness. Goldry laughed and said, Whom has he sent us? Laxus, you think? to make his peace with us again for that vile part of his practice against us of Kartadza, detestably falsifying his word he had given us. Just said to the serving man, You saw the ambassador. Who is he? Lord, answered he, his face was strange to me. He's little of stature and by your highness's leave the most unlike to a great lord of witchland that I ever saw, and by your leave, for all the marvellous rich and sumptuous coat he wears, he is very like a false jewel in a rich casing. Well, said Juss, a sour draught sweetens not in the waiting. Call we in the ambassador. Lord Juss sat in the high seat midmost of the dais, with Goldry on his right in the seat of black opal, 
and on his left Spitfire, throned on the Alexandrite. On the dais sat likewise those other lords of demon land, and the guests of lower degree thronged the benches and the polished tables, as the wide doors opened on their silver hinges, and the ambassador, with pomp and ceremony, paced up the shining floor of marble and green tourmalin. Why, what a beastly fellow is this, said Lord Goldry in his brother's ear. His hairy hands reach down to his knees. He shuffles in his walk like a hobbled jackass. I like not the dirty face of the ambassador, said Lord Zig. His nose sits flat on the face of him as it were a dab of clay, and I can see pat up his nostrils a summer day's journey into his head. If his upper lip bespeak him not a rare spouter of rank fustion, perdition catch me. Were it a finger's breadth longer, I might tuck it into his collar to keep his chin warm of a winter's night. I like not the smell of the ambassador, said Lord Brandoch Daha, and he called for censers and sprinklers of lavender and rose water to purify the chamber and let open the crystal windows that the breezes of heaven might enter and make all sweet. So the ambassador walked up the shining floor and stood before the lords of demon land that sat upon the high seats between the golden hippogriffs. He was robed in a long mantle of scarlet lined with ermine, with crabs, wood lice, and centipedes worked thereon in golden thread. His head was covered with a black velvet cap with a peacock's feather, fastened with a brooch of silver, supported by his train-bearers and attendants, and leaning on his golden staff, he with raucous accent delivered his mission. Joss, Goldry, and Spitfire, and you other demons, I come before you as the ambassador of Gorais the Eleventh, most glorious king of which land. Lord and great Duke of Butany and Estremeran, Commander of Shulan, Thramni, Mingos, and Permio, and High Warden of the Ezamotian Marches, Great Duke of Trace, King Paramount of Bestria, and Nevria, and Prince of Ar, Great Lord over the country of Oyadia, Maltraini, and of Baltri and Toribia, and Lord of many other countries most glorious and most great, whose power and glory is over all the world and whose name shall endure for all generations. And first I bid you be bound by that reverence for my sacred office of envoy from the king, which is accorded by all people and potentates, save such as be utterly barbarous, to ambassadors and envoys. Speak and fear not answered Jus, you have my oath. The ambassador shot out his lips in an O, and threatened with his head, then grinned, laying bare his sharp and misshapen teeth, and proceeded. Thus says King Gorais, great and glorious, and he charges me to deliver it to you, neither adding any word nor taking away. I have it in mind that no ceremony of homage or fealty has been performed before me by the dwellers in my province of demon land. As the rustling of dry leaves strewn in a flagged court when a sudden wind strikes them, they went to stir among the guests, nor might the Lord Spitfire contain his wrath, but springing up and clapping hand to sword hilt as minded to do a hurt to the ambassador. Province, he cried, are not the demons a free people? And is it to be endured that which land should commission this slave to cast insults in our teeth, and this in our own castle? A murmur went about the hall, and here and there folk rose from their seats. 
The ambassador drew down his head between his shoulders like a tortoise, baring his teeth and blinking with his small eyes. But Lord Brandoch de Ha, lightly laying his hand on Spitfire's arm, said, The ambassador has not ended his message, cousin, and you have frightened him. Have patience and spoil not the comedy. We shall not lack words to answer King Gorais. No, nor swords, if he must have them. But it shall not be said of us of demon land that it needs but a boorish message to turn us from our ancient courtesy toward ambassadors and heralds. So spoke Lord Brandoch Daha, in lazy, half-mocking tone, as one who but idly returns the ball of conversation, yet clearly so that all might hear. And therewith the murmurs died down, and Spitfire said, I am tame, say your errand freely, and imagine not that we shall hold you answerable for anything you say, but him that sent you. Whose humble mouthpiece I only am, said the ambassador, somewhat gathering courage. And who, saving your reverence, lacks not the will, nor the power to take revenge for any outrage done upon his servants? Thus says the king, I therefore summon and command you just Spitfire and Goldry Bluesco to make haste and come to me in which land? in my fortress of Carsi, and there dutifully kiss my toe, in witness before all the world that I am your lord and king, and rightful overlord of all demon land. Gravely and without gesture, Lord Juss hearkened to the ambassador, leaning back in his high seat with either arm thrown athwart the arched neck of the hippogriff. Goldry, smiling scornfully, toyed with the hilt of his great sword. Spitfire sat strained and glowering, the sparks crackling at his nostrils. You have delivered all, said Juss. All, answered the ambassador. You shall have your answer, said Juss, while we take reed thereon, eat and drink and he beckoned the cup-bearer to pour out bright wine for the ambassador. But the ambassador excused himself, saying that he was not athirst, and that he had store of food and wine aboard his ship, which should suffice his needs and those of his following. Then said Lord Spitfire, No marvel, though the spawn of which land fear venom in the cup. They who work commonly such villainy against their enemies, as witness Ricador of Goblin Land, whom Corsus murdered with a poisonous draught, shake still in the knees lest themselves be so entertained to their destruction. And snatching the cup, he quaffed it to the dregs and dashed it on the marble floor before the ambassador, so that it was shivered into pieces and the lords of Demon Land rose up and withdrew behind the flowery hangings into a chamber apart to determine their answer to the message sent unto them by King Gorais of Witch Land. When they were private together, Spitfire spoke and said, Is it to be borne that the king should put such shame and mockery upon us? Could he not at the least have made a son of Corund or of Corsus his ambassador to bring us his defiance instead of this filthiest of his domestics, a gibbering dwarf fit only to make them gab and game at their tippling bouts when they be three parts senseless with boozing? Lord Juss smiled somewhat scornfully. With wisdom, he said and with foresight has which land made choice of his time to move against us, knowing that thirty and three of our well-built ships are sunken in Katadza sound in the battle with the ghouls, and but fourteen remain to us. Now that the ghouls are slain, every soul and utterly abolished from this world, 
and so the great curse and peril of all this world ended by the sword and great valour of demon land alone now seems the happy moment unto these late mouth friends to fall upon us for have not the witches a strong fleet of ships since their whole fleet fled at the beginning of their fight with us against the ghouls leaving us to bear the burden and now are they minded for this new treason to set upon us traitorously and suddenly in this disadvantage for the king well judges we can carry no army to witch land nor do anything in his despite but must be long months a ship building and doubt not he holds an armament ready aboard at tenemos to sad hither if he get the answer he knows we shall send him we sit at ease then said goldry sharpening our swords and let him ship his armies across the salt sea not a witch shall land in demon land but shall leave here his blood and bones to make fat our cornfields and our vineyards rather said spitfire apprehend this rascal and put to sea today with the fourteen ships left us we can surprise which land in his strong place of Carsey, sack it, and give him to the crows to peck at, or ever he is well awake to the swiftness of our answer. That is my counsel. No, said Juss, we shall not take him sleeping. Be certain that his ships are ready and watching in the witchland seas, prepared against any rash onset. It were folly to set our neck in the noose, and little glory to demon land to await his coming. This, then, is my reed. I will bid Gorais to thee do ello, and make offer to him to let lie on the fortune thereof the decision of this quarrel. A good reed, if it might be fulfilled, said Goldry but never will he dare to stand with weapons in single combat against you or against any of us nevertheless the thing shall be brought about is not gorais a mighty rustler and has he not in his palace in Carsey the skulls and bones of ninety and nine great champions whom he has vanquished and slain in that exercise puffed up beyond measure is he in his own conceit and folks say it is a grief to him that none has been found this long while that durst wrestle with him and woefully he pines for the hundredth he shall wrestle a fall with me now this seemed good to them all so when they had talked on it a while and concluded what they would do glad of heart the lords of demon land turned back to the lofty presence chamber and there Lord Just spoke and said, Demons, you have heard the words which the king of which land in the overweening pride and shamelessness of his heart has spoken unto us by the mouth of this ambassador. Now this is our answer which my brother shall give, the Lord Goldry Bluesco. And we charge you, O ambassador, to deliver it truly, neither adding any word nor taking away. And the Lord Goldry said, We, the lords of Demon Land, do utterly scorn you, Gorais the Eleventh, for the greatest of dastards, in that you basely fled and forsook us, your sworn confederates, in the sea battle against the ghouls. Our swords, which in that battle ended so great a curse and peril to all this world, are not bent nor broken. They shall be sheathed in the bowels of you and your minions, Corsus to wit, and Corund and their sons, and Corinius, and what other evil doers harbour in waterish witch land. Sooner than one little sea pink growing on the cliffs of demon land shall do you obeisance. But that you may, if you so will, feel our power somewhat. I, Lord Goldry Bluesco, make you this offer, that you and I do match ourselves singly against each other to wrestle three falls at the court of the Red Foliot, 
who inclines neither to our side nor to yours in this quarrel. And we will bind ourselves by mighty oaths to these conditions, that if I overcome you, the demons shall leave you of which land in peace, and you them, and the witches shall forswear forever their impudent claims on demon land. But if you, Gorais, win the day, then have you the glory of that victory, and with all full liberty to trust your claims upon us with the sword. So spoke the Lord Goldry Blusco, standing in great pride and splendour beneath the starry canopy, and scowling terribly on the ambassador from which land, so that the ambassador was abashed and his knees smote together, and Goldry called his scribe and made him write the message for Gorais, the king, in great characters on a roll of parchment, and the lords of demon land sealed it with their seals, and gave it to the ambassador. The ambassador took it, and made haste to depart, but when he was come to the stately doorway of the presence chamber, being near the door and among his attendants, and away from the lords of demon land, he plucked up heart a little, and turned and said, Rashly to your certain undoing, O Goldry Bluesco, have you bidden our lord the king to contend with you in wrestling? For be you never so mighty of limb, yet has he overthrown as mighty. And he wrestles not for sport, but will surely work your life's decay and keep the dead bones of you with the bones of the ninety and nine champions whom he has heretofore laid low in that exercise. Therewith, because Goldry and the other lords scowled upon him terribly, and the guests near the door fell to hooting and reviling of the witches, the ambassador went forth hastily and hastily down the shining stairs, and across the court, as one who flees along a lane on a dark and windy night, daring not to turn his head lest his eye behold some fearsome thing prepared to clasp him. So speeding, he was fain to catch up about his knees the folds of his velvet cloak, richly worked with crabs and creeping things, and huge whooping and laughter went up among the common lag of people outside to behold his long and nerveless tail thus bared to their unfriendly gaze, insomuch that they fell to shouting with one accord, Though his mouth be foul, he has a fair tail. Saw you not his tail? Hurrah for Gorais, who has sent us a monkey for his ambassador. And with jibe and unmannerly yell, the crowd hung lovingly upon the ambassador and his train, all the way down from Galing Castle to the quays, so that it was like a sweet homecoming to him to come on board his well-built ship and have her rowed amain out of Looking Haven. So when they had rounded Looking Haven nets and were free of the land, they hoisted sail and voyaged before a favouring breeze eastward over the teeming deep to which land. Two. The wrestling for demon land. How could I have fallen asleep? cried Lessingham. Where is the castle of the demons? And how did we leave the great presence chamber where they saw the ambassador? For he stood on rolling uplands that leaned to the sea, treeless on every side as far as the eye might reach. And on three sides shimmered the sea kissed by the sun, and roughened by the salt glad wind that charged over the downs, charioting clouds without number through the illimitable heights of air. The little black martlet answered him, My hippogriff travels as well in time as in space. Days and weeks have been left behind by us, in what seems to you but the twinkling of an eye and you stand in the foliate isles, a land happy under the mild regiment of a peaceful prince, on the day appointed by King Gorais to wrestle with Lord Goldry Bluesco. 
terrible must be the rustling between two such champions, and dark the issue thereof. And my heart is afraid for Goldry Blusco, big and strong though he be, and unconquered in war. For there's not arisen in all the ages such a rustler as this Gorice, and strong he is, and hard and unwearying, and skilled in every art of attack and defence, and subtle withal, and cruel and fell like a serpent. Where they stood, the down was cut by a comb that descended to the sea, and overhanging the comb was the palace of the red foliot, rambling and low, with many little towers and battlements built of stones hewn from the wall of the comb, so that it was hard from a distance to discern what was palace and what native rock. Behind the palace stretched a meadow, flat and smooth, carpeted with the close, wiry turf of the downs. At either end of the meadow were booths set up, to the north the booths of them of Witchland, and to the south the booths of the demons. In the midst of the meadow was a space marked out with withies, sixty paces either way for the rustling ground. Only the birds of the air and the sea wind were abroad as then, save those that walked armed before the witches' booths, six in company, harnessed as for battle, in burnies of shining bronze, with greaves and shields of bronze and helms that glanced in the sun. Five were proper slender youths, the eldest of whom had not yet beard full-grown, black-browed and great of jaw. The sixth, huge as a neat, topped them by half a head. Age had flecked with grey the beard that spread over his big chest, to his belt stiffened with studs of iron, but the vigour of youth was in his glance and in his voice, and in the tread of his foot, and in his fist so lightly handling his burly spear. Behold, wonder and lament, said the martlet, that the innocent eye of day should be enforced still to look upon the children of night everlasting. Corund of Witchland and his cursed sons. Lessingham thought, A most fiery politician is my little martlet. Damned fiends and angels and nothing between for her. But I'll dance to none of their tunes, but wait for these things unfolding. So walked those back and forth as caged lions before the witches' booths until Corund, halted and leaning on his spear, said to one of his sons, Go in and seek out Gro, that I may speak with him. And the son of Corund went, and returned anon with Lord Gro, that came with furtive step, yet goodly and fair to be whole. The nose of him was hooked like a sickle, and his eyes great and fair like the eyes of an ox inscrutable as they. Lean and spare was his frame, pale was his face and pale his delicate hands, and his long black beard was tightly curled and bright as the coat of a black retriever. Corin said, How is it with the king? Gro answered him, He chafes to be at it, and to pass away the time he plays at dice with Corinius, and the luck goes against the king. What make you of that? asked Corund. And Gro said, The fortune of the dice jumps not commonly with the fortune of war. Corund grunted in his beard, and laying his large hand on Lord Gro's shoulder, he said, Speak to me a little apart. And when they were private, Darken not counsel to me and my sons. Have I not these four years past been as a brother unto you, and will you still be secret toward us? But Gro smiled a sad smile and said, Why should we by words of ill omen strike yet another blow where the tree totters? Corind groaned. Omens, said he, increase upon us from that time forth 
when the king accepted the challenge, evilly and flatly against your counsel, and mine, and the counsel of all the great ones in the land. Surely the gods have made him fay, having ordained his destruction and our humbling before these demons.'